because um, this, the session, starting with last week's session, which was uh, Roberta Gez, who spoke to us about coping, will now be found on the website. So oh, okay. you can follow it there. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody to mute themselves, or I can actually mute you all. Um, let me see if I can mute you all. Do have anybody waiting? Mute all. Okay. Current and this would be yes. Okay. And I am going to unmute Judy after I give an introduction to um of her. And it's a, um I've known Judy a long, long time, and I can honestly say that she's one of the most accomplished women that I have ever met. And um, I think all of you will be surprised at the breadth of her accomplishments. I know she's going to focus on one thing today, but take some time to ask Judy some of the questions about all the things she does. Truly an amazing person. And I'm thrilled to have her with us today. Judy was born in New York City and she uh, settled in Boston after going to getting her uh, bachelor's of fine arts and master's of fine arts from Boston University. And she majored in painting while she was in school but while she was there, she developed a love for printmaking early on in her artistic life. At various times, her prints encompassed most of the traditional forms, including etching, monotype, dry point, and collagraph. Now, I know Judy has explained these to me several times, but it's like, you know, I'm not sure I really know what the difference is, and maybe she'll let us know. How many of you know the difference between those four things? Yeah, okay, <laughs> Judy. Um, at various times, oh wait, let me go on. She is a founding member and past president of Full Tilt Print Studio, the printmaking cooperative located in Hyde Park. And I just found that it's right near where the train station is if you're going through Hyde Park. So um, maybe we can all visit it sometime. That would be fun. She used a camera like a sketchbook as a means of recording what she observes. In 2005, she took a course in digital photography and Photoshop at Massasoit Community College, where she learned how to use a digital camera and edit her pictures. And she figured out a way of combining printmaking and photography by exposing her digital images to light sensitive polymer plates to create photogravure, 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 I, yes, if I spoke, I'll pronounce it in French, photogravure uh, etchings. But the photographs are the inspiration for her prints. She is the author and illustrator of a children's book called Little Cat Lost, published last year. And if you uh, were lucky, you went to a sisterhood program where she presented that book to us. Her work is in the permanent collection. Now, you're going to be impressed. In the permanent collections of the Boston Athenaeum, the Boston Public Library, the Art Complex Museum in Duxbury, Fidelity Investments, the Fog Art Museum, Hebrew Senior Life, Wheaton College, and the Worcester Art Museum. She's a member of the Boston Printmakers, the Griffin Museum of Photography, the Phot Photographic Resource Center, and the South Shore Camera Club. And she has been widely exhibited both locally and nationally. So we are really, really thrilled to have Judy as our presenter today, and I will now unmute Judy. Hi, Thank Judy. You. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. I'm... Okay, what can I say? <laughs> Thank you for all the kind words. So I actually wrote something because I thought it would be a way of keeping my thoughts together. It's a three or four minutes where I sort of explain a lot of things. And then I can show some examples of my work and answer your questions, if that's okay. Okay, so here we go. My thoughts about photography. As Debbie pointed out earlier, my film camera was always an indispensable part of my equipment. As a representational artist and connected to my love of travel, I used it like a sketchbook and worked from photos when I went back to my studio. So when I entered the digital era, the first decision was which camera to purchase, a point and shoot or a DSLR? In case anyone would like an explanation, DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. This means that there is a mirror inside the camera which reflects the image seen through the lens onto the viewfinder. Thus, when you look through the viewfinder, 
you see exactly what the lens sees. With a point and shoot camera, that is not the case. It is an approximation of what the lens sees. The advantage to the point and shoot camera is that it is smaller and lighter weight than a DSLR camera. But the disadvantage is that most point and shoot cameras only shoot in JPEG. Also, you cannot have a timed exposure for longer than 30 seconds and you cannot change out the lens. Initially, I opted for a Canon point and shoot camera, which I have right here. Uh -huh. There it is. <laughs> okay. And that worked very well for me. But at a certain point, I wanted to set longer exposure times and also to shoot in RAW or NEF, as well as JPEG. If you plan to edit your photos, it is best, if possible, to shoot in RAW. RAW images have many more pixels per inch and provide more information than JPEG images. It also allows you to enlarge the image considerably without sacrificing quality. So when I realized I wanted to use longer exposures and perhaps change lenses, I purchased a basic Nikon DSLR. It too served my purpose well for several years until one day it would no longer allow me to set a manual exposure. I found out then that digital cameras have a built-in limit as to how many times the shutter can be fired before the camera stops working. No. In the interim, there were many new types of cameras that had come on the market. The most innovative were mirrorless cameras. As the name implies, there is no mirror inside the camera, which reduces the weight. Instead, these cameras use a digital sensor to record what you see through the lens. The problem is that the sensor tends not to be as large or as sensitive as that found in a DSLR. Another issue is that most mirrorless cameras do not have a viewfinder. They use the screen. When the light outside is very bright, it is difficult to see the image on the screen. DSLR cameras have a viewfinder, so I chose to stay with Nikon and bought a middle-of-the-line model, which I have right here. So this is my Nikon. Okay, there were several reasons for this choice. One was price, but also weighing what I felt I needed in a camera, I didn't need one with all the bells and whistles. Another reason was size, because the more expensive cameras tend to be larger and heavier. Weight is a big factor for me as I get older. Some photographers are really into having elaborate equipment. I am not. So let's get into the different settings. It's certainly easy to have the camera set on auto, but you're allowing the camera to make all the decisions regarding exposure, shutter speed, etc., which also defeats the point of having a camera that's adjustable. At the opposite end is manual, but with that setting, you have to decide everything yourself. Shutter speed, ISO, lens aperture, etc. When I was on a photography workshop in Ecuador, I learned a lot about settings. The ISO depends on the lighting. Bright light needs a higher ISO, while dim light needs a lower setting. In low light, a higher ISO produces noise in the image. The instructor also recommended putting the camera on shutter priority and then letting the camera determine the other settings. This allowed for flexibility without always having to adjust everything with each shot. Light. For landscape scenes, the best lighting is either early in the day or at twilight, so-called crepuscular light. At midday, the light can be very harsh and produce two contrasty shadows. Using an external flash is helpful when taking shots of people outdoors or for portraits. Equipment. As I mentioned earlier, the choice of camera can be confusing. Also, additional lenses, a tripod, and an external flash are options. If you want to shoot landscape from a distance, a wide angle lens might be an option. For close-ups, a macro lens is a possibility. What to photograph? What interests you? Landscape, people, 
sporting events, portraits, whatever. I went on a few workshops and I joined a camera club. Between the monthly competitions at the camera club and the road trips, I learned a lot and I met some nice people. Editing. I learned how to use Photoshop and Lightroom and they are my go-to programs, but it took me a long time to get comfortable using them. There are also plug-in programs such as On One, which can work well. I love the black and white filters in Silver Effects Pro. But my rule of thumb is that good composition and exposure are most important. It is also extremely important that your pictures be in focus. A term that is often used is tack sharp. There is no editing program that can fix a picture that is out of focus. And then there is the temptation to overwork a picture while editing. This includes over sharpening, over saturating colors, overuse of HDR, etc. As some of you know, I take many of my photographic images and create polymer plate photo reviewer etchings. The reason I do that is because I think this technique brings a sense of texture and depth to the image that is more than what I see in a printed photograph. So now I will show you a few of my photos and answer any questions. Thanks for listening. Okay. All right, so I will begin sort of near the beginning. I'll just keep going. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned my trip to Ecuador. So I got a lot of images from that. This is one of them. Can everyone see it? Can you come closer? It's kind of too big for the screen. All right. Nice. All right. Are so I random people. Yes. So um, I went. I was in Ecuador the end of June in 2013, and we went to uh, attend the summer solstice festivals up in the highlands where the indigenous people, it's kind of a combination of um, uh, Christian observance and the old Indian um, religion. So they do this at the summer solstice. Okay, so. This is another one. Beautiful. I'm going, to, I'm going to unmute people in case people okay. have questions. So let me unmute you. Okay. But please um, observe, you know, raise your hand and I'll call on you so we don't all talk at once. Maybe the smaller ones are a little easier to see. So these are, you know, people, um, the, the point of it, and it got me out of my comfort zone. I was used to doing landscapes and architecture, and this meant you had to go up to people and ask if it was okay to photograph them. And most people were very kind and let me do it. And I, I got some really interesting photos. So here's some youngsters at one of these festivals. <laughs> And Judy, I have a question for you, a technical yes. question. And this is anybody who photographs might ask this too. I, I always was, uh, I think I was, I am to believe that you're supposed to focus on the eyes. So that when you're taking a picture that you should try and focus on uh, either a person or an animal's eyes, and that gets you the best in focus picture. You want to get that, that glimmer of light, the, ref the light reflected from their eyes. Yes, if you can. Yes, yes. So in this case, um, uh, well, I did in a lot of the, uh, I used um, the external flash. Here's what that looks like. And you, you put that on your camera and you can adjust the angle. And so you want a, sort of a soft light over the person's face. No matter what time of day? It depends. I can't say, you know, one way or the other. So we, we went to a lot of different markets. What is he holding? He's holding a, a gourd, a couple of uh, gourds. What interesting creation. 
some more kids. And they were all dressed in these costumes. It was really fun. We had a great time. Okay, this was a black and white. This was in Quito. Kids going to school or coming home from school. All right, this was at one of the festivals. And so obviously to me, I don't know if everybody else picks up on this, she doesn't wait for them to look, you don't have to take people's faces straight on. No, you know, you know, but I mean, you want their attention. It depends what you're after, you know. And then this, one of the few landscapes, this was the view from the hotel where we stayed mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Highlands. Every night I took pictures of this. This was from my balcony. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's a volcano. Isn't it gorgeous? The, yeah. the view is just amazing. Okay, so that's Ecuador. All right. Changing the atmosphere a bit, I have a very dear friend who retired to New Mexico. And I've made a number of trips to visit her. And, you know, she's also an artist. And so we have gone to different places. And we had we made a couple of trips to White Sands, New Mexico. So this is one of my mm. favorite images. Oh. This is a yucca plant. It's not on the big screen. Oh, it isn't. Okay. Well, no, there. There it is. If you go to speak of no, it's gone. It's gone. You can see okay. it. Right. I would recommend everybody go to speaker view. Where is that? This is, this, these are all in White Sands, New Mexico. No, I, I mean, I apologize. Stay in, stay in gallery view. I apologize. Okay. Okay. If I made her the host, then she could definitely go to speak of you and it would work. So we also went to, um, what's the name of the place now? <laughs> I'm having, it's not White Sands, it's, uh, I'm having a senior moment, I forgot the name of the place, but there are these incredible rock formations. Wow. Wow. Sure. wow. Oh, I mean, looks like a <laughs> Was that a person next to it to give us a perspective? No, 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 just rocks. No, no people. Oh, I see. Cameras. <laughs> she has, she showed four that she has. I mean, okay, what else? Um, this is also a favorite of mine. This is at White Sands also. Oh, wow. wow. Beautiful. At sunset. And, and here's another one. Tent Rocks. Tent Rocks is the name of the national park. And there's another mm. image. So. I assume that all the colors are as they are. You haven't done any filtering to change the color. Well, no, that's not true. <laughs> I have. In, in this one, there, there's a filter in Lightroom that I like to use. It's called Hallowed Black. And it brings out the, the, the golden color. And I really like that. So it's not exactly the, the color of, of the scene. But I'm an artist. I can do that if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody has questions, feel free to ask. And if you're muted, just and tell me when you've seen enough. If you want to, okay. And then I did a, another photography workshop with the same guy from that I went with in Ecuador, and we went to New York. Uh, so we went to Brooklyn uh, a few years ago in April, and this was outside as a little uh, a little restaurant, and I call them my three graces. Oh. <laughs> These wonderful ladies, they were good friends. So. <laughs> I thought they were great. And then here was someone else. This was at um, the 9-11 uh, memorial. 
so uh, we, I saw this lady in her beautiful red cape and I went up to her and I said, can I take your picture? She didn't speak English very well. And she said, yes. And I, I got this shot. And then um, our leader, the, our instructor, the photographer, he okay. came over to her and, and asked if he could take her picture. She said, no, I don't like your attitude. <laughs> <laughs> that looked like a painting. Yeah. And then this was also in Brooklyn. And it was, it was April, the black and white version. Looks like a tree that grows in Brooklyn. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Okay, then let's see. Okay, so I thought you might be interested in this. When I talked about um, wanting to do different exposures, um, I got into a, a technique called light painting. And this requires that you set, you, you take a picture in a completely darkened environment and you use a flashlight to paint it while the camera is going. And so there may be some people, so I did this, I took a, I did this, there may be some people you recognize here. <laughs> if you can. What year was that? This was like 2009. Uh -huh. Okay. And here's someone else you might recognize. <laughs> wow. Still she happens to hate this picture, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a picture, and, and now you tell me what's before. Tell me again how you do it. Okay, so um, it, when I was in Canton, I had this uh, great closet, you know, um, walk-in closet with no windows, and I would drag people in from the street and bring them up to my closet and put them <laughs> on a stool, and I'd have my camera all set up so there's no light. You turn the camera on, um, and I take a, a flashlight and I start painting with light the, around them. And uh, when I've had enough, I turn the camera off and there we are. And then I, I get this image. So here's one of me. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh wow. <laughs> a few years ago, I would look much younger. Here's one of Deborah. She was about 12. She's one of my favorite models because she really can hold still. So now I think people, if you go to speak of you, you'll find just Judy and, and the few pictures on the side. So if you try that, you might see your pictures better. What do you mean? What do you want me to do? I, I, no, you're fine. I just, okay. what I did is I muted everybody. And now if you okay. go to speak of you, is that if everybody goes to speak of you, you'll see the paint, they paint the, the pictures much better. Okay. And this is also Deborah. And with this one, I did uh, I interrupted the um, the exposure so that she could turn her face. So it's the three faces of Deborah. Wow, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, all right. Another trip I took was to Ecuador. So I don't know if anyone's been there, if you've been to the Goldfoss waterfalls. So this also, you know, I worked on. This is not straight from nature. And here it is in black and white. And oh, this is actually... I went with uh, the Boston printmakers. We did um, an exhibit of prints in Reykjavik and um, we got to meet some artists. And anyway, this was the man who organized the trip. So at, at the exhibit. And here's another, the landscape there is incredible. And everywhere there are geysers and, you know, geothermal fountains. It's amazing. What is that, what is that in front? Is that water or is that mountain? No, it's, it's a lava field. Oh. With steam coming up in the back. This is Iceland. This is Iceland, yes. 
Okay, and what's this? So then with the camera club, uh, several years ago, we did a road trip to Maine. We went up to Kennebuck to the Trolley Museum. And so I have a bunch of images from, from that. This was in one of the places where the trolleys are located. And then we had lunch. Can I interrupt you in that picture? Huh? I, know, I know that that's very interesting because you have the lines leading you places. Right. Which makes you wonder what voyage this is going on. So it's a good tip for people to know about following lines when they take photography. Right. Well, I mean, I could give a whole lecture on composition, on, on doing it, but, you know, it's kind of hard to do it in 10 minutes or whatever. Right. So okay. here's a, a view from Kennebunkport. We had lunch. And no, I'm not going to do that one. Okay, so this was inside one of the old trolleys. Can you see it? Mm -hmm, great. And here it is in black and white. Let's see. It was a really interesting trip. The nice weather it was good. And then we also we stopped off at um, the famous lighthouse in Maine. I can't remember the name of it, but um, Portland. Yeah, Portland. Portland Light. This is not the lighthouse, obvious, obviously, but right around there. And here it is in black and white. So it's always really nice if you have good clouds. That really helps <laughs> to make it interesting. And I'm always looking for different textures because it also draws you in. Okay. Were most of these pictures done in raw? What? Were most of these pictures taken in raw? Yes. Yes. I mean, early on, uh, I used the, the point and shoot camera and did JPEG. And you can do fine. You know, it really, it's okay. It depends. Certainly, if you're going to keep it small. But um, basically, you really need to shoot in raw. Okay. And then, in 2016, I went to Cuba. And I did a portfolio of prints based on that trip. There are about 29 of my etchings. And I have a few of the photo photographs that the etchings were taken from. So here is one of them. So these were mainly in Havana, because that's where we were. It was also um, through the Boston printmaker, not the Boston printmakers, but it was a print type thing. We, we visited lots of artist studios and we saw different exhibits. It was very interesting. And of course, I got the icon some of the iconic cars. Now here it is in black and white. And okay. Judy, do you print all these yourself? These, yes, I have a very good printer. I have, I have a, a Canon Pro 10, which is really, really good. It's very, you know, if you want to do it, it's very important. Um, okay. And this was my young Cuban man. <laughs> he didn't know I was taking his picture, but. <laughs> and here he is in color. And this, I just have a few from that. Um, oh, this is one of my favorites. This has gotten into a lot of shows. I call it Old Havana Courtyard. It was in the old part of Havana. So Judy, you would have had to have two cameras with you then at all times. No, 
I, for this trip, I only had one camera. I didn't use how, my... How do you do um, the black and white and, and do the color of the same person? Editing. Editing. I, I shoot in color and then I convert to black and white. Oh, okay. When I want to. Okay. And then this one is the image of a yagruma leaf. And I found them, uh, there is a, an art center, an art school um, that was built in the 60s. And we visited there. And the, there are the yagruma trees in, you know, in the courtyard. And I picked up a few of the leaves. And supposedly, the yagruma leaf represents the persona of the Cuban people. Mm. So I used the leaf as the beginning and the ending of my portfolio of prints. So mm. this is the ending. It's the back of the, of the leaf, which is almost pure white. And the front of the leaf in the front of, I don't have a picture of it right now, is uh, almost, it's a very dark green. So don't ask me why it represents the persona of the Cuban people, but <laughs> I just went along with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, uh, we're almost done. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a few images from the vineyard. My sister has a house there and I've been going to visit her. This is the view from her house at sunset. Uh, she's on, uh, she has access to Katema Bay. Okay. And um, this is, I walked one day, it's near her house, it's Cape Pogue. Okay, and then this is, this is a new one too. I call it lazy kayaks. <laughs> okay, and then let's see, do this at the end. Okay, so um, the same year I went to um, Iceland, at the, after the end of the summer, I went with Miriam and Andrew, we went to Niagara Falls, because I'd never been there, and so I got this shot of Niagara Falls. Beautiful. And I have it in black and white. And then, Here's the group. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, a, just a few years ago. <laughs> okay. You can tell it's a few years ago because at this point, David is much bigger than Andrew. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, not much bigger, but the same size. And he's not wearing braces anymore. <laughs> okay. And let's see. Okay. So here's one I did. This is New Bedford Harbor. And we did a, a trip to, a, again, a camera club road trip to Quebec. So this, I took this picture. This is actually a panorama. I, I uh, stitched some pictures together of a field of rapeseed. And okay, uh, so oh, here I'll show you this. This was from a trip that Alan and I took, it was like the last trip he could take with me. We did a Danube River cruise, and so this is um. All of a sudden, I can't remember the name of the city. Anyway, this was taken with the point and shoot camera because that's what I had at this time. So you could still do it, still get very good work with point and shoot. And then last year, I took a trip with Miriam and Deborah uh, to Italy, and we were in Pompeii. And it, the weather, you know, was really interesting. Wow. The storm came in, and so I had these really great clouds. Wow. So I call it Pompeii before the storm. 
And one day we were staying in Sorrento. One day we went to Capri. So, all right. And then to end up, I will. Okay, I have a couple of Boston scenes. This is, you know, from the seaport district at dusk at night. Also a camera club road trip. And this one was quite last fall. We did, uh, we went to photograph the Longfellow Bridge at dusk at night. And I happened to see these runners running underneath the bridge. I thought it was an interesting shot. So. Okay, I think that's about it. Oh, you're quite the artist. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to unmute everybody so we can have any questions that people have. Absolutely. Uh, Judy, do you enjoy black and white? Uh, I love, as I love much Black and white as much it. or more than color? Well, certainly equal to color. I mean, equal and, to color, really. Yes. And in, in many ways, it, it all depends. For black and white, you have to have a nice range of tonality. You know, if it's too light or too dark, it's no good. So you want that range of tonality. But what I do find is when I convert some of my color images, I get a real sense of texture. And I really like that. So beautiful work. Thank Beautiful you. work. Anybody, raise your hand if you have a question so that I'm happy to call on you. I, I know that I love to um, photograph sunsets. Okay. But I find that sunsets are very hard to photograph people in front of them. Right. Unless you want, unless you want to silhouette the people. That's right. Are there any recommendations of photographing people in front of light? Well, mm -hmm. I would say if you can have the, the light off to one side so that it's not directly behind the person. I mean, it's, it's just the nature of the beast. It's hard. Right. Anybody if, else have if any? You shoot, if you shoot away from the sun and like sometimes like the reflection of, of the sun, it will reflect back onto the people. So instead of the skin like looking like it's like white, it'll look more like a, give up more like a reddish color at sunset versus, you know, like being like a white person per se. Yes, but the, the problem is if you want to have that, that sense of the sunset, that's hard to do. It's hard to do it. It, it it's, is. It's not, I not agree. easy. And of course, my favorite time at the beach is the golden hour. Right. Anybody who goes to Nantasket Beach, which is where I am all, every summer. Right. And you right. see people with the golden glow from right. the, at that time. But it's not that easy to capture either. By right. Judy had mentioned... Um, um, the fact that she had asked a lot of different people if she could um, be able to shoot them, you know, because sometimes people do object to being shot. Yes. Right. So when I was working for Canton Cable and I had done the same thing, I, before I would even point the camera at them and I would ask, do people mind if I would film you? And it, and I did tell them, it's going to be on TV, so do you mind if I shoot you? And then you will be seen on TV, you know, like for the general public. And I'd say overall, most people do not mind my being able to shoot them and, and then them being seen on local cable. Right. So does anybody else have any questions about uh, anything, the photography tips or any of Judy's um, past. She, I know she showed me different things that, that you could probably um, learn a lot from her spending a day with her. So I'm really <laughs> grateful for her sharing these, um, her, some of these beautiful, beautiful prints with us and some of the pointers that she has. And um, I, I, we are so lucky to have this talent. So without any other questions, I'm going to say, if, yes, Alan. Um, <clears throat> Judy, are you taking any courses now? No, I'm not. Are, are giving any? Um, you know, I've, I, I haven't really taught photography. I've taught my printmaking technique in workshops at different places over the years. I haven't done anything recently, but, um, you know, I, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm an artist and I, I 
use it for my art. So, you know, I'm not a commercial photographer. I don't do that kind of thing. And um, so, no. <laughs> if anyone's interested, I'm happy to. <laughs> I think Alan's saying he'd like to take a course. I would like to, too. <laughs> okay. think, I would, too. If you ever think of it, let us know, because there'll be others of us. <laughs> and no other, no other comments? We can do it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Judy, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you and uh, kudos to you. Thank you, Judy. And thank, thank you, Judy. Judy. Thank you. Next pleasure. Week, just a little uh, advertisement about next week. Next week, we have um, uh, Sam Evans' mother, Sandy Evans, who has an absolutely beautiful voice, is going to be doing a solo concert for us. Lovely. So that should be yeah. really nice. Yeah. She's and great. And the following week, we're going to be, uh, Michelle Langmead is going to be teaching us, if you, you could either be using it as a, um, just watch us, if you're not one to, to bake, but she's going to be teaching us how to make a, um, I can't remember the exact name, but it's a fancy, um, French or Viennese, I can't remember. Uh, shortcake, um, cheesecake. Cheese, cheesecake, torte, and that's an honor of Shavuot. So either you can enjoy it vicariously, I will be sending out ingredients, a list of ingredients and utensils during uh, the week previous to that so that you can get ready for it and make sure you have all, everything necessary. And you can invite others to join us for all of these. And with that, I bid you all adieu. Have a nice okay. evening. And thank, thank you. you for day, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Judy. Thanks, Thanks Judy. Well, thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. So um, this will be on here for next Thursday. Yes, every Thursday. Every Thursday. Thank you. Four o'clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye. Bye. I'll be back. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 So is that okay, Debbie? That, that, that was, was wonderful. Good? That, Judy, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for You're doing welcome. that. Really appreciate it. I think it was sure. very interesting. The pictures were beautiful and um, great. Thank great. you. You know, you're, you're quite a talented person. Thank you. So I appreciate you sharing with everybody. Okay. I, I have fun. I enjoy it. <laughs> Keeps <Great>. me sane. <laughs> And that's, and that's the purpose of this, is just to like highlight the talent of people that we have living among us. Right. Um, I'm having a little bit of, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of other people and their talents, right. and I don't know everybody. So right. now that I heard that we're going to be going on through the summer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you need to think of more things. Okay. You two, who are, the three who are still on, if you know of anybody, of, okay. like people I don't know, okay. um, it would be great. You know, it right. would be great. It would be, right. it would be fun. Uh, and I just got the idea. If, if people wanted to do like a, a camera road trip, go, go somewhere nearby. Oh my God, that would be so wonderful. You know, because I find I really enjoy doing that because these are places a lot of the time I don't want to go by myself. I don't feel comfortable. But in a group, it's, you know, it works out really well. Can we do this during the, during the, this period of time? I would have to do it um, when people... Oh, that's true. It might be a problem doing it now. Yeah, we we'll have to wait. Yeah. That would be a wonderful idea. Yeah. Something to right. keep in mind. Right. All right, everybody. Goodbye. Nice to see you all. Speak to you. I'll see you soon, whether on uh, the rabbi's class or whatever. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.